Welcome to Good Tech, an ongoing discussion about ethics and technology. I'm Elizabeth Perry with IDCA. Today we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to get a fresh perspective on privacy from a privacy professional, someone who's worked, whose work centers around the practical applications of privacy in our digital world. Privacy matters, tips and perspective from the front lines of digital privacy. Privacy and legal officer at Zynap writer and host of the Swedish podcast, Privacy Podden, please welcome Hannah Shellman. <laughs> Hannah, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to see you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Yeah, me too. It's, uh, I, I have to say this, this is our first lady on the, on the show and I'm very, very excited. Um, so we're going to get down to it. Uh, first thing, the role of a privacy professional has, be, has become so important. Um, they're everywhere now, and we never <laughs> used to hear about this thing. Um, so I'm sure the audience would be curious to know about how you got into the privacy realm in the first place. Well, I, I studied law at the uh, university. So uh, I was working as a lawyer, and uh, I was very into, I've always been very interested in, in the tech world as such and um, I uh, was working a lot at that time I was working mostly with marketing law and uh, copyright law and I was very into you know the whole influence and marketing sphere and I was at a seminar and uh, there was this guy there who was talking about uh, I think this was late 2014 or early 2015 and he was talking about, you know, the EU, they're going to come out with this new data protection regulation. And uh, at that time, nobody really cared about the personal data issues, at least not in Sweden. This was not a big thing at all. And mm -hmm. um, I quickly realized that I think this is going to be huge. And this is something that I think is needed. I had started to think about, you know, Facebook and you share a lot of things there and uh, sort of started a process of my own, but I wasn't quite there. So when this guy talked about it, I uh, I quickly realized that this was kind of intriguing and was probably going to be you know a big deal in uh, in Europe at least. So I started following you know the uh, legislative process and tried to keep myself updated. And then when the um, legislation was finally done in 2016, I uh, I got some headway uh, at the company where I was working and we uh, we had a team who worked uh, non-stop with the GDPR basically since then. Mm -hmm. And so what you know we talked earlier about your role as a privacy officer or a privacy professional it's not just about being GDPR compliant we'll talk about more about that later but what is your day-to-day -day like what is what is your role as a privacy professional? Uh, it's very, I would say it's varied. Um, at SignUp, I, I am the head of legal, but I have a privacy in my title. So hence the privacy and legal officer, which means that I, I do the day-to-day -day, uh, head of legal stuff too, you know, agreements and negotiating agreements and such. But um, the privacy part is, of course, GDPR is huge for for us in, uh, in Sweden. So um, mm -hmm. making sure that, uh, we're always uh, up to par with everything that we need to be and I, I remember when I was uh, when I was starting at Zynap I was told by one of my colleagues that yeah we at this company we believe that GDPR that's a great first step but we want to be beyond GDPR and that was actually what attracted me to to the company is that uh, I felt like we want to be a bit ahead of GDPR which I think is it's a good thing, especially at a company where you process a lot of personal data and sensitive personal data, you have to have a huge a responsibility and you have to show that you take on that responsibility in a, in a good way. So I'm 
um, in all the processes, if we want to buy, you know, new um, new systems that we are going to store personal data and you know change, you know, email uh, providers and and things like that. And so I have some say in in those matters. And when we're doing marketing, how to do that and try to do that in an ethical way, as ethical way as possible, which is very important as well, of course. And so I work closely with the with the entire team. I would say. And on my spare time, I, I work with privacy as well, because so there were many hours in cars and on um, trains and at hotels where we uh, were discuss discussing privacy. And we, uh, we have sort of a similar view. We're not always in agreement, um, but mm -hmm. we, uh, we figured, you know, there's nothing really out there in Swedish uh, on the podcast market where you talk about privacy that specifically. Now I think there is another Swedish podcast, but they are uh, focusing on the legal aspects of it. And we are trying to preach to the non-converted, um, to more like the general public, to people who are not privacy professionals and who are not lawyers and who are not tech geeks and just regular people trying to create awareness by, by talking about privacy in, in context that everybody is somewhat touched by in their day-to-day -day lives. So we did um, one podcast where we talked about Tinder and the location data when you use dating apps. And we talked about sharing photos of your children in social media. We talked about um, late, latest news. Like in Sweden, there were some issues with um, some municipalities believe that we can no longer take photos of the students in the schools. Uh, for mm -hmm. the teachers to use and for getting them to uh, the parents to order photos because of the GDPR because we we don't know how to get consent or find a legal basis for that so we take uh, we talk about recent events most mostly in Sweden but basically all over the world uh, about privacy so we have we're on season two now and uh, we had one guest in our first season and we're planning to have more guests in this uh, coming season or in this season that we're we're on uh, we try to avoid inviting other lawyers to the podcast because we're already two lawyers and uh, the more lawyers you have in a room the more lawyer it gets and uh, not particularly fun if you're not a lawyer yourself so we right. uh, we had the realtor on actually uh, for the first uh, season. So we talked about analog privacy. So privacy in our homes uh, and how a realtor really gets, uh, gets close to the people who are selling their homes and you get access to their homes and it's a huge responsibility and how do you honor that? And this season we, uh, we will keep on inviting people who have very fun uh, professions that we can dig into privacy with. So it goes beyond then the digital privacy that we're always talking about on this show. We, you talk about it. That's interesting. I didn't realize that. Yeah, we tried to put it in context. We had we played a game in one one podcast that was called on the bus at the bus stop um, online and uh, in the on the phone with a friend uh, in a public place. Uh, it sounded better in Swedish. <laughs> um, and, uh, you can say it in Swedish, I'm sure. Our, or you can teach some Swedish to our uh, audience. I'm sure they'd appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> no, then I will start speaking Swinglish instead. I'm trying to avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> but the game was, would you share this particular type of information online on your social media? Would you share it if you're sitting on a bus talking on the phone with your friend? And would you share it to a told stranger uh, at the bus stop? Or I think we had at work was a part of it too. So uh, mm -hmm. we gave each other examples of your wife has gotten pregnant. Would you say that online? Would you say that to a friend on the phone? Would you say that at work? Um, you're in a new relationship, um, stuff like that. I try To try to put it, I think people are prone to share a lot more online than they would share in the analog world, which is a very, uh, so it's a fun comparison to do and it gets people thinking, I believe. Yeah, that is an interesting difference. And I think one of the things that, that drives me crazy online is that people sort of hide behind 
the computer screen. You're not actually seeing someone face to face. So you're more apt to, you know, say things that are maybe a little bit out of line, maybe even, you know, and, and, um, and I think we have to be really careful about that. Um, Yeah. But anyway, um, so your audience sounds pretty diverse. Um, are you, do you have a demographic, um, or do you, I mean, I know you have a lot of, you have a lot of listeners, but I'm curious, you know, where are they coming from? What, who's interested in privacy? Well, for the sake of privacy, we don't re- even really know. <laughs> 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 I love that answer. <laughs> I'm sure there are a uh, very advanced analytics tool that we could use to figure out like, where did these people live? And uh, when do they listen, what time of day and stuff like that. But uh, the one that we use does not provide that. So we know um, how many listens we have each on each episode. And um, we know how many total listens we have. And mm-hmm. um, if you look at the iTunes tool, I think you can see uh, a little bit more, maybe age groups. I'm not sure. I might be convinced. Mm-hmm confusing it with Spotify. I think there's one of them at least where you can see uh, how many listens on that particular platform you have in a specific age group. Um, mm-hmm. But not much, not much more than that. And what I've seen uh, in that regard, it's very diverse. Um, you can't really say that it's younger or older or middle-aged or it's, it's very diverse, I would say. Yeah. Well, that's good to know, and I and I hope that the the uh, viewership continues to go up. Um, it's an important thing to talk about, of course, as you, as I talk about it too every day. And um, it is interesting, though. Just a little side note on the um, tools that people use. Um, we've had a couple of shows on marketing, and we plan on having more because there's so much to say about marketing and privacy. Because you know we're so data driven we talk about data, we talk about collecting data, we talk about seeing what our users are doing, how they're behaving, where they're coming from, what they like, all this stuff. And there, there are very few tools out there for just trying to get an idea of who your audience is um, yeah. without trespassing or compromising people's privacy. So that is the challenge. And uh, I'm sure you find that as well. Yeah, I actually, uh, with a colleague from our marketing department, we did a uh, speech at a conference together uh, about AI marketing, and we named it AI marketing and and law and unhappy marriage. And uh, (laughs) it was basically about how the two don't mesh like at all. Uh, So yeah, it's a challenge. It's a very, it's a huge challenge to try to market yourself or your product in an ethical way because mm-hmm. the tools that are out there uh, to a large extent is, is not really compatible with the GDPR at all. For, uh, no. for you, it's, it's very hard um, when looking at, you know, buying tools for marketing for, for the company. It's, it's very hard to find something yeah. that feels good all the way. Yeah, we had um, one of our guests, Jason Voyevich. I don't know if you saw that show. Yeah, I saw that. It was really good. Yeah, so that was for me really exciting because as a marketer, you know, I was, I felt a little bit better after that show about like how, you know, how we can as companies do, you know, good things and be recognized for doing it the right way or the ethical way. But anyway. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the, the whole importance of privacy. Most millennials I speak to, for example, um, have this as an answer that they, when I ask them, why don't you care about your privacy? Why do you use some of these tools online and why don't you care? And the answer is we grew up giving our data away in exchange for free services. So how do you penetrate that, that blockade that, that I'm getting from millennials, for example? I mean, how? what's your answer to that? Yeah, I think that's a difficult question because I, I think personal data has become, like it or not, uh, a somewhat of a currency 
and it's used somewhat of a currency. Um, and I also have noticed that some services have this uh, saying that, you know, either you pay for the service or you provide us with your email address instead. Or if you want to read this article on our, on our website, then you have to provide us with your email address. And mm -hmm. I would say, I think it's a bit problematic, but if you are consenting and if you know what you are consenting to, and if it's not about, you know, creating a profile about you or tracking your every move online or um, giving away very sensitive data, or if it's about children, um, I would say, I mean, I'm a very <laughs> liberal person in that regard, you know, everyone has to do be able to do what they want out of free will if they are informed and they are consenting adults. So um, I, I'm a bit torn uh, in that regard. I think it's, it depends on why and how and what you understand. Um, when using Facebook, for example, if we're going to use them as the, the example for um, the free tools where you give away uh, a lot, uh, in order to use them. Um, if something is free, you have to ask yourselves why? Like, what is right. the business model? Why is this free? And we did, uh, actually in the latest podcast we released, we talked about free messaging services and we compared Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp with uh, Signal, Telegram, um, you know, I mean, it guys sort of a message is, it gets a lot more, but also I use, I use it primarily to <laughs> send messages. And yeah. uh, if you can use something for free, you have to look at the terms and conditions. Why is this free? How are these companies making money? And for, I think, Signal, I think they had their business model was this is, I mean, it's Signal.org. They are a nonprofit and you can make donations uh, as a user to keep them going. And uh, I think the same goes for Telegram. They had a big... Um, financer who believed in what they were doing and gave them a lot of of money to to build the service and to keep it going and they mm -hmm. um they're also a non-profit and facebook makes their money by selling ads i mean they're an ad network that's basically if you look at what they make money from they're an ad network which means right. that you use the service for free but you pay by letting them profile you so right. every site that has a Facebook tracking pixel on them, which is a lot of sites that you visit, um, yes. Facebook will know that you visited that site and they can make assumptions about who you are as a person, what you're interested in, and thereby sell your data to marketers who can target you for online advertising. And I mean, I, I have a Facebook account, so I'm a complete hypocrite, but my stance is that I know about this. I know what's happening. I know how they use my data and I choose to use Facebook. I have a Facebook account. Not really happy about it, but it, it is what it is. But I don't think that most who use Facebook or who use Google are aware of exactly what they are in fact paying for the right. free research. So it's kind of like a, I mean, I'm on Facebook as well. And most of the, most of the reason that I'm on Facebook has to do with what I do for a living. Um, because I work with IDCA and I want to know what sort of features there are and what people talk about and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I get what you're saying. And I think that it's almost like a necessary evil sometimes. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, so, and let, let's talk about some of your work. I was reading a recent piece you wrote in Medium and it rang some bells with me. Um, the piece was entitled, Mark Zuckerberg doesn't want you to read this and why it's a perfect day to exercise your online human rights. Uh, and it was an article that, it, that came out on uh, privacy day, data privacy yeah. um, day. And I'm gonna quote you if I may. You say, a personal data breach is not a GDPR compliance issue, it's a human rights issue because many companies are looking at privacy that way, merely to stay GDPR compliant. So talk to me about our right to privacy and why it's so important for businesses to understand. Yeah, um, there is, uh, privacy is a human right. If you're a Europe European citizen, it is a human right, according to the uh, European Convention for, for Human Rights. 
which says that we have a right to privacy in our homes and we have a right to privacy when it comes to our correspondence. So mm -hmm. you can say that the GDPR is basically part of, you know, an outstretch of the uh, human rights uh, that we have. So, and I think it also depends on what type of company you run. If you run a company where you get access to people's correspondence or you facilitate people's correspondence like an email provider or a messaging provider, or if you uh, put uh, IoT stuff in people's homes like Amazon Alexa or the Google Home or Google Assistant, I don't know exactly what it's called, um, mm -hmm. responsibility not only under the GDPR or that type of legislation, but you also have a responsibility when it comes to human rights. And uh, mm -hmm. I think that the companies who <laughs> provide these services to a large extent um, either doesn't know or doesn't care that sometimes the processing that they conduct is a complete violation of human rights. And for other companies uh, who sell stuff, you know, B2B, not really that much personal data, smaller companies, um, I can see that for them, it is more of a GDPR compliance issue because you don't process the same type of data and you don't use it in the same type of way. But for tech companies like Google or Facebook or Amazon, it's definitely a, a human rights violation mm -hmm. sometimes, I would say. Right. And, they're, and, and are they understanding that more and more, do you think, or are they just paying the fines and looking the other way? I don't know. Um, I don't know if if uh, <laughs> if I want to be skeptical or optimistical. Um, I don't know. As long as they keep making these huge profits that they are making by actually violating the legislation, and as long as that's profitable for them, I don't think that anything will change other than surface level. Mm. Like, that's a very yeah. non-optimistic answer. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's a realistic one. I think. Um... It's all about a lot of people. Would, yeah, a lot of people will agree with you. I mean, of course, they've got lobbyists and yeah. everything else working in their in their favor. So um, another passage that resonates with me in that uh, article was um, quoting you again. I believe that it's 100 percent possible to run a successful business without ever compromising the right to privacy. And you say, I also believe that the corporations that will be standing strong in five to 10 years are those who share this point of view. Now that one like gives me goosebumps because I'm like, <laughs> really? You mean we can still be successful and, and respect people's privacy? And so, and it's a strong statement, um, but I think it's probably one of the most important ones. And, and I hope you'll share with us a little bit about how businesses can be successful without compromising the right to privacy. I mean, it's all about choice, really. I mean, you don't have to choose um, the ad tech models, um, but it makes it harder. Um, so I would think uh, in a perfect world for me, we need to redo the whole ad tech model as it is today with the profiling right. and the tracking pixels and the stalking people online without them knowing. Um, I, In a perfect world, what I would like personally for myself is some sort of an ad exchange service. I think there are multiple of those in the works uh, already where I as a consumer can sign up and I can say, these are my favorite brands. This is the stores where I like to buy my shoes. This is the brands that I use for my hair or my makeup, or these are the brands of food that I always buy. And uh, the companies uh, sign up on the other side and then they uh, get to buy personal data. If I, I can share, I can choose for myself if I want to receive emails with offers on these products that I actually want to buy and, and want to know when they're on sale, for example, or when there's a good deal for me. Or if I want to have a, get a text message when there's a deal, like I can choose for myself how I want to receive it. And then mm -hmm. the advertiser on the other side pays the ad exchange to get my personal data. And I also get a part of the Part of the cake that's uh -huh. uh, I think that's more ethical and also I think it's better for the brands and the companies as well because then you don't have to use profiling to try to figure out 
or pigeonhole people like me as a woman who's 30 years old. I get so much commercials for like diapers and pregnancy tests. And I mean, I don't have children. I don't need to have com like ads about baby food. So they are yeah. basically just trying to figure me out. And uh, right. I think, yeah, and sometimes that can be insulting as well. So um, I think it's better for the brands as well to know, like here are 10,000 consumers who want to buy your products. They have specifically asked for you to send them marketing material. I mean, mm -hmm. that's gold. How do you find, I mean, I think that's, I think that's the way to go. And I also think that people are, more and more starting to figure out that the whole ad tech model and how it works and how you're not getting any of the money that this, I mean, multi-billion dollar industry is generating. And I think mm -hmm. more and more people are getting kind of sick of that and doesn't think that it's fair at all. So mm -hmm. I think that we'll see in a few years, also G the GDPR keeps getting enforced and there are large fines being uh, doled out. So I think just wait a few years and I think the ad tech model will have to change. And I think uh, being building your company on a like digitally sustainable foundation, I think will pay off. I hope so. At least. And what about a, just a, you know, like it cause the subscription model um, where users actually are paying yeah. um, the price of a cup of coffee per month for their privacy. Do you think people are going to go for that? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I can only look at myself. Uh, of, course, of course, I'm a privacy <laughs> nerd, so I'm very <laughs> into this. But I, I think it's, uh, for me, I always feel better if I can pay for a service. Of course, I don't want to pay <laughs> all that much. You know, we're a bit uh, yeah. shy away. You know, if you can get something for free from somewhere else, I wouldn't pay like a hundred dollars for it or <laughs> ten dollars. Right. For it. I don't know. Yeah. But uh I think that the uh, I think it would show a level of commitment to privacy and like a level of seriousness that we are not going to target you with ads. We are not going to do anything of, of that. But if you want to to use the service, we we have to we have to go around somewhere somehow as a business. So uh, mm -hmm. I think that's one way to do it. And mm -hmm. uh, for me, I I find a service more more serious and more trustworthy if I at least had the choice to to pay for it mm -hmm. like if, if Facebook had a choice like either you pay for it and we won't target you and we won't do any of this sneaky stuff then maybe I would think a little higher of them maybe yeah I mean do you think though that, that if you talk about Facebook and I'm just thinking you know how can they suddenly turn around and say okay well we're not going to harvest your data anymore. We're not going to sell it to third parties. We're not going to use it to profile you. We're just going to make you pay. You yeah, they would have to redo the entire business model. Oh, but that so. it's impossible. It's impossible, don't you think? I don't yeah. Know. I'm also a bit curious. Have you heard about their new privacy tool settings? Um, the module. Yeah, I have heard about that. And I, I guess it, it takes 30 days to actually go away. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if I buy it. I don't know. I just, no, I think, I think it's for show. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, but let's see. I mean, each step that they take, uh, I would say it's better than <laughs> the step before. Um, right. but I'm not, I'm not sure. And I don't know how the advertisers feel about it either if uh, Facebook users are able to delete all their uh, traces from third party trackers. Um, I don't know. Right. I mean, that's just, that's their business model and it, it doesn't seem like that's changed. And, you know, we talk about surveillance capitalism. I mean, these guys are the Kings yeah. of surveillance capitalism. Um, but so, so tell me like, what do you think uh, some more tips maybe for people who are running businesses, maybe small to mid-sized companies or even larger companies? I mean, what are your top tips for um, things that we can do to succeed as companies while keeping privacy intact? I mean, I think one thing 
that we have done and sign up, we have communicated it uh, quite aggressively. And I know you have too at, at IDCA, actually telling people, this is what we do and this is what we're not doing. And this is why, why we're not doing it to mm -hmm. also create awareness around why should you choose a service that does not do this to you. Mm -hmm. um, but also when it comes to advertising, I think it's hard uh, to reach out without using the, the shady ways so to speak, mm -hmm. um, social media, for example. But um, you could also, I mean, before we did the whole profiling thing, people bought ads at sites where they felt like this is where our targeted audience probably will spend time. Like if you're going to sell running shoes, you probably want to do the, the advertising on a service where runners hang out, like Strava, for example, that's a community for runners. So I think... I mean, the, the old ways are still there. <laughs> Not that we're going yeah. to move uh, backwards, but I mean, sometimes you have to go back and redo because the fact of the matter is like the ad tech model where you profile people without their consent, that's not legal. And that's pretty heavy fines under the GDPR if you keep doing it. So um, something will have to change. And I don't know how long that's going to take, but I'm hoping that these types of ad exchanges that I, that I personally want, uh, would like to see, I hope that they will start coming soon. I know Brave, uh, the Brave browser is trying to build something like that. So, Yeah, what do you think about Brave? I mean, they're, they're making a lot of waves, um, you know, in terms of uh, privacy on my Twitter feed. They're always talking um, you know, about using Brave and DuckDuckGo and these other sort of tools, I mean, and, and IDCA, <laughs> but what, what other sort of tools do you recommend people use that are privacy compliant? Well, I use Brave. Um, I have since the day I was told about it. Uh, I, I really like Brave. I think it's a great browser. Um, the uh, They are trying to connect advertisers to consumers also with their uh, bats. Uh, I think they're calling it the basic attention tokens, which means you will get paid to watch ads. So you can choose when uh -huh. to watch them and you get paid in this uh, cryptocurrency, I guess it is, bats, uh, which you can use. Uh, and you can also provide services that you like, like websites that you visit a lot. You can provide them with bats so they they can get those from you so you can pay the site uh, in that way instead um, instead of letting them harvest all your data uh, if you enjoy them so I think that's the one way to start I think that's a good good way to start I don't think they have rolled it out in Sweden I haven't been able to watch any ads and get any bets yet but I'm hoping I will soon so that's a great browser um, I use DuckDuckGo yeah, um, yeah. And I mean, of course, I would be lying if I said it was better than Google. I mean, Google have so much more data and their hits when I do a search are more accurate. But mm -hmm. I, I've worked with uh, DuckDuckGo for quite a long time now. So I, I'm, me and DuckDuckGo have become friends. We, we understand each other now, I feel like. So <laughs> I use DuckDuckGo. I think DuckDuckGo might be even better if you're uh, in the US because it's not oh. really that good when you search in Swedish. But if you search for US uh, companies or if you search in English, it's, uh, you get better matches. So I think it, it will have to learn Swedish a bit. <laughs> but I'm training so, it. Working on it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it works, right? I mean, if you, if you use these tools, it, it, you teach it basically by... I mean, there is an algorithm or something that, that sort of knows after a while what what you're looking for is that how it works i'm not really yeah i don't think that DuckDuckGo knows exactly what you are looking for because they are more privacy friendly so they right. don't profile you um and i think the reason that google is more accurate is because they have all this data on you already so they can kind of figure out what you're after so i think mm -hmm. that's uh, the difference so that's what you have to weigh in uh, when you choose which one to use there's also a great uh, search engine called ecosia where hmm. uh, I think for every, I don't want to say a, a number, but for example, let's say 10,000 or 100,000 searches made, they plant trees. 
So it's kind of, they are working with the environment as well. So by using that search engine, you're actually helping plant trees. So that's a good thing. That's great. That's Uh, great. I haven't haven't heard of that one. How do you spell it? And we'll put it up on the... uh, E-C-O-S-I-A, I I think. Where are they based? Um, I heard about them when I was in Germany. I think they might be German based. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when you're working in, in, um, you know, in in your role as a privacy professional, do you have to kind of cross borders or are you dealing with just the EU and GDPR? And I mean, because German law, for example, is a lot stricter than most. And I guess Swedish law is getting there, right? Yeah, I mean, now we all have the GDPR, so now the law yeah. is the same, but they uh, they are much further along, uh, which is obvious. I mean, Sweden was, we're, I think we were very behind most other EU countries. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, in Germany, they are very sensitive about sharing data and being registered. And the e-commerce took a long time to get rolling in uh, in Germany because people wouldn't give up their email addresses. So there's a very different way of, of thinking. Um, so uh, now we have the GDPR, so now everybody is the same. Um, so it's that makes my job easier. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we are, um, we have customers in the US as well, but we're treating everybody equally. So everybody is getting the same treatment under the GDPR and the same rights that European customers are, are getting. So we're not doing any distinctions in that regard. Mm-hmm. So we're kind of wrapping things up in the next few minutes, but um, you know, we, you talked a little bit about the, the outlook on privacy and sort of, you know, I, I got a sense from you that you were a little bit pessimistic or, or, that it is grim. I mean, so many people are like, yeah, it's already out there. The data is already out there. There's nothing you can do about it. There's no way to change the ad based model. I mean, what do you, or do you have any predictions about privacy and how things are going to play out? I mean, as a lawyer, I would have to say that I, I believe that the, the law will have to be enforced, um, which means that the ad based model, like the way that it works today, it can't work that way because it's not legal. There's very little about it that is legal when people don't know that their data are be, is being processed, um, when they don't know that they're being tracked online by the Facebook pixel or the Google pixels, um, that's not legal. So something will have to change. Mm-hmm. I don't know how, but uh, I'm hoping for, for a big change. And that might take time, but it's going to have to come because there are going to come fines uh, under the GDPR uh, for this type of uh, of advertising. So we'll see. But I'm, I'm a bit pessimistic, but I'm also a bit hopeful. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're working on it, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> you're working on getting pe- making people aware. So um, good on you. And I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. Um, so any final thoughts for the audience on um, anything that we've talked about? Um, no, I would just advise those who haven't already installed the privacy badger add-on or downloaded the Brave browser to just do that and visit some of the sites that you normally visit and just take a look at how many third-party trackers are actually blocked by privacy badger or, or Brave because the first time I did that, I, I was quite scared I would say I I didn't know it was that bad so and also I didn't know that it was that bad on just a regular news site where I go to read the daily news so just uh, it it gets you thinking so if you if you haven't already just download privacy badger or brave and also use itka don't use facebook messenger (laughs) that's very true in fact if you guys want to uh Reach us if you have any questions for Hannah or myself or one of the founders of IDCA or um, you can reach us on IDCA. It's www.idca.com. It's free to set up a basic account. You can look around and bring your groups because that's how IDCA works. You bring your private groups on board and start your own organization and, and see how it is. So 
thanks so much for joining us, Hannah. It was great to talk with you, and I'm sure we'll have you on again. So thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Have a nice morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. And, uh, and we'll see you next time.